I'm Arnie Gunderson, Chief Engineer and Board Member for Fairwinds Energy Education. It's March 2016, and five years ago this month, the triple meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi began. Maggie and I and the Fairwinds crew have received many questions about how this disaster began, its current status, and what the future after such a major catastrophe may look like for the Daiichi site, for Fukushima Prefecture, and for the people of Japan. All of us at Fairwinds created this video to answer your questions and share the truth about the ongoing tragedy at Fukushima Daiichi. First, let's look at why this disaster happened at all. Many of you know that in addition to the public information work we do with the nonprofit Fairwinds Energy Education, we work together as a paralegal services and an expert witness firm that Maggie founded in 2003 named Fairwinds Associates. During the first quarter of 2011, we were working on several cases and uncovering a number of significant safety issues at very different plants here in the U.S. One night, after a dinner walk only three weeks prior to Fukushima Daiichi disaster, Maggie said, you know, we look at a lot of aging nukes and we're uncovering so many safety risks. Arnie, what do you think the next radioactive disaster will be? I said, I'm not sure where it will be, but I'm sure it will be in a General Electric Mark I boiling water reactor. Unfortunately, I was right. The Fukushima Daiichi Atomic Reactor is a GE Mark I boiling water reactor design. If you listen to the mainstream media, you might believe that these three atomic reactor meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi are strictly a problem produced in Japan. That is absolutely wrong. All of the major design decisions at Fukushima Daiichi were made in the USA including placing the diesels in the basement and ignoring the 2,000-year history of huge tsunamis. The atomic reactor itself was designed by General Electric in San Jose, California, while the entire Unit 1 power plant was designed and constructed by Ebasco, located in downtown Manhattan. Today, in the United States, there's 23 atomic reactors identical to those still in meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi. The atomic power industry would have you believe that the Japanese nuclear program is somehow inferior to the U.S. counterpart. Moreover, it wants you to believe that such a catastrophe could not happen in the U.S. And once again, the nuclear industry is absolutely wrong. All of the mechanical problems that cause the equipment malfunctions at Fukushima Daiichi are also present in each of the 23 GE Mark I boiling water reactors here in the United States. But more importantly, the same engineers that designed 100 atomic reactors here in the U.S. used the same skills to design the six reactors at the Daiichi site. And finally, the people we're supposed to trust to regulate the United States plants, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or the NRC, have been compromised by the atomic power industry just like the Japanese regulators were. Japanese technology is not inferior to U.S. atomic technology, and the regulation of Japan's nuclear power and materials industries are not less regulated than those we have here in the U.S. For that matter, several U.S. plants are in such decrepit condition and also located in earthquake faults or downstream from leaking dams that it is only dumb luck that none of Americans' atomic power plants have suffered meltdowns since the 1979 disaster at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. For more than 40 years, both American and Japanese engineers have been absolutely aware of the many design flaws that caused the meltdown and accompanying explosions at Fukushima Daiichi. Senior managers at the Atomic Energy Commission, the regulatory precursor to the NRC, 
expressed grave concerns about the GE Mark I containment design as early as 1972. Subsequently, in 1985, a report issued by the NRC identified that if a meltdown occurred, there was a 90% probability that the Mark I containment would explode. Afterward, another NRC report from the 80s showed that General Electric's entire reactor design was more prone to a meltdown than other atomic reactors because it was designed with many holes in the bottom of each reactor to facilitate the movement of the control rods required to slow down and stop the atomic chain reaction. These control rods significantly weaken the floor of each GE boiling water reactor. And finally, again in the 80s, NRC reports indicate that GE and NRC knew that the high pressures, the high temperatures, the high radiation levels after a nuclear meltdown would cause the plumbing and the electrical conduits in each of the containments to fail totally thereby allowing groundwater to leak into the molten core. The ongoing disaster at Fukushima Daiichi simply proves these early engineering analyses from the 70s and the 80s were absolutely correct. Not one safety system operated as it was designed, and consequently, massive amounts of radiation continue to enter Japan's water and air and bleed into the Pacific Ocean daily. No one in the atomic power industry wants to discuss why these reactors were operated for 40 years knowing that they were ticking time bombs, and why dozens of similar reactors are even allowed to operate today. You've heard me say it before here at Fairwinds, follow the money. Quite simply, the atomic power industry and its regulators put the interests of investment bankers, atomic power and weapons brokers, and the government eager to retain atomic capability ahead of our public health and safety. It was obvious back in 2011 that these poorly designed and aged reactors that are sitting in an earthquake zone would continue to bleed radiation into the Pacific. Clearly, leaking radioactivity will be an ongoing phenomena for decades at least. Here's what I said when I was one of the first to identify this leakage back in 2011. The building, that box, is called a reactor building, and inside that is the containment. And um, as pressure started to build up in units one and unit three, they vented the hydrogen gases into the reactor building, and that's what blew up. And that the, the uh, dramatic pictures of the explosion were of the reactor building. Um, Underneath that rubble is the containment, but in the building that's intact, they didn't vent it in time, and they had a hydrogen detonation inside the containment. And that's kind of like sneezing with your mouth closed and your nose pinched, it's going to pop your eardrums. Well, what happened on Unit 2 is that as a result of that explosion, the containment itself broke. And so now radioactive liquids are leaking out of the containment into that trench. I want to shrink this down for a second. I want to come back to the pictures in a minute. But for now, I want to just talk about how much water. Because the company says 11,500 tons of radioactive water. We're not minimizing this at all. Going into the Pacific Ocean, that's about enough water to fill five large swimming pools. The Pacific Ocean, as you can see, this is, in terms of the volume of the Pacific Ocean, Mr. Gunderson, this is literally a drop in the bucket. However, you think the company is understating the concern here about the radioactivity? Well, they pumped the... They needed to empty tanks on site um, because they, the, the tanks had concentrations of liquid that were 500 times what was permissible. But the stuff they needed to put in them was much more radioactive than that. So the 11,000 uh, tons that they pumped overboard today was to clear tanks so that more radioactive liquid could come behind it. The leak that they just fixed, though, for the last couple of um, a uh, couple of weeks has been leaking something on the order of seven tons a day, not of the 500 time concentration, but of the much more concentrated radioactivity into the, into the ocean. So there's, there's a lot of radiation in the ocean. People around the world write to Fairwinds asking why the cleanup is taking so long. 
And how soon will the disaster be over? Less than one week after the triple meltdown started, I was interviewed on CNN. And I said then, and I'll say it again, cleaning up Fukushima will be a long slog. While we at Fairwinds Energy Education were speaking truth to power during the first week of the meltdowns, government officials here in Europe and in Japan were trying to convince people around the world that nothing bad had happened at TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi site. Don't worry, be happy seemed to be the theme song around the world so that each country that owned atomic power plants could continue operating its reactors without its citizens being concerned for their own health and safety. Many FOIA, that's a Freedom of Information Act document request given to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, have produced a series of emails from inside the NRC that show that U.S. engineers and the Commission itself knew exactly what the world was watching via the Internet and social media was a real tragedy of enormous proportions. In spite of this knowledge, throughout the world, in atomic reactor countries, government officials didn't tell anyone just how severe this calamity was. I spent almost 45 years in the atomic power industry, and I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in nuclear engineering. I was also a licensed reactor operator. I taught reactor physics at Rensselaer, and I had an Atomic Energy Commission fellowship. I also have a patent on a nuclear safety device. Well, when I was interviewed on John King on CNN on March 18th, 2011, I was the first person in America and in Japan to publicly say what many nuclear engineers, regulators, and government officials all over the world already knew. It, it has been described already, Secretary Chu today called it, Arnie, uh, worse than Three Mile Island. Uh, based on everything you know tonight, is there a chance that it will be worse than Chernobyl? I actually think it's at Chernobyl level right now. Uh, you know, you have four different reactors. Uh, a year ago, uh, the worst case imaginable was 1% fuel failure with a containment that leaked a tenth of a percent per day. That's what we thought was the worst that could happen. And now we're finding 70% fuel and a containment with a hole in the side of it. Uh, this is uh, 100 times worse than the worst case we imagined a year ago. Uh, sobering, sobering, sobering perspective. Arnie Gunderson, Sharon Squassoni, appreciate both of you so much. Two months after I said that on the John King Show, while nuclear engineers and regulators maintained silence, and after the nuclear power industry called me a liar, Japan's government officials belatedly told the world the truth about the failure of TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi atomic power plant. The world was finally told that the system failures and meltdowns in Japan were as bad as Chernobyl. What took them so long? As I've said all along, follow the money. As we look back on these devastating atomic power-induced tragedies, it's easy to determine the moment that both the debacle at Chernobyl began and the moments in time that TEPCO's Fukushima atomic reactors began to melt down. But now, five years later, no one knows when any of those ongoing man-made radioactive cataclysms will end. As Yogi Berra, the famous American baseball player and coach would say, it ain't over till it's over. Sadly, Fukushima is far from being over. For me, as a nuclear engineer, it was obvious immediately after the disaster began as it was to many others with a similar te technical background to mine, that it would take an extraordinary amount of time and a phenomenal sum of money to clean up the worst industrial calamity in human history. In February 2012, I was an invited speaker to the Foreign Correspondents Press Club in Tokyo, where I told the worldwide media, I, I believe that over the next 25 years, the um, total cleanup, especially in Fukushima Prefecture, um, 
we'll add another 190 billion US to that. So 60 billion for the plant and 190, I believe it will be about a quarter of a trillion US to uh, completely, uh, over the next 20 or 30 years, to completely clean up after this accident. As an experienced nuclear engineer and a former nuke industry corporate senior VP, I did not want to see the cover-ups and risk to families around the world that I saw after Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Fairens and I spoke truth to power immediately in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Global Post. The two-hour interview I did with the Wall Street Journal was never published. We at Fairwinds worked unceasingly to make sure that accurate information reached the media all over the world. The saddest thing that happened to me during the last five years was to witness how the governments in Japan and the U.S. and the worldwide atomic energy industry continue to claim that little or no radiation is impacting the people living in Japan. The truth is already beginning to make itself known. And during the next five years, the world will see a rapid increase in thyroid cancers, followed by organ cancers, hard tissue cancers, and leukemia in those exposed to the massive amounts of radiation that were released in Japan. Many of Japan's government officials continue to apply enormous pressure to doctors, to scientists, to teachers, and to journalists in order to prevent them from analyzing, discussing, and informing people about the health ramifications from such extensive and invasive radiation. Because they are so much more radiosensitive, children, especially young girls, and their mothers will be the real casualties of this disaster for decades to come. We at Fairwinds estimate that at least 100,000 and very possibly as many as a million cancers will result from this ongoing and unmitigatable atomic disaster. Tissue damage to people in Japan due to radioactive hot particles has been and continues to be completely ignored by the world's nuclear community. I was the first scientist to discuss the release of Fukushima hot particles. The ongoing radioactive legacy of hot particles will linger throughout Japan, literally, for centuries. Maggie and I and the Fairwinds crew have repeatedly been the first organization to talk about and publish information informing you about the dozens of other significant issues that other scientists and government officials in the nuclear power field have not. Some of these scientists and officials have told us that they were either afraid to discuss or they were forbidden by their corporate employer from speaking about the information we've made public with you. While we're proud to share our knowledge with you, we're also dismayed that mainstream media has failed to tell the truth about the worst industrial disaster in human history. So what did we learn from the triple meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi? First, we learned there will be more atomic reactor catastrophes in the future. Second, during the next nuclear disaster, emergency evacuation plans will fail again because government officials place atomic power profits before the health and safety of its people. Third, nuclear containment systems are absolutely incapable of enclosing and isolating radiation released as the catastrophes begin and as they continue unmitigated. Fourth, these prolific radiation releases will cause upwards of a million deaths, even though officials will claim that none have occurred as they did at Chernobyl and at TMI. Fifth, the irreversible costs of atomic power to us, to you and I, the people of the world, greatly exceed any profits or any benefits that the corporate owners of nuclear power receive. Sixth, due to its triple meltdowns and the unmitigatable radioactive releases, 
Fukushima Daiichi will continue to bleed radiation into the Pacific Ocean for more than a century. And finally, there is no roadmap to follow with directions to stop the ongoing debacle that is Fukushima Daiichi. It will be a long slog. Renewable energy is so much safer and economically viable. With the legacy of TMI, Chernobyl, and now the ongoing calamity at Fukushima Daiichi, why is the world even considering building more atomic power plants? And with aging degraded atomic reactors, climate change induced flooding, tsunamis, hurricanes, typhoons, along with moving tectonic plates creating earthquakes worldwide, why indeed are any atomic reactors operating anywhere in the world? I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and we'll keep you informed. Thank you.